So yeah, good afternoon. My name is Anderson, and in the next couple of minutes, I want to discuss about a bit with you guys about code generation in Go. Right. So uh, let's yes. So a bit about myself. Who am I? I'm a Brazilian. I've been living in Berlin for the last two years. Since I started coding when I was ado an adolescent, it was about 15 years ago. So uh, yeah, from hobby to profession, it's something that I really like. And Go, I started to work with Go last time that I counted about two and a half years ago. I wasn't, of course, always a Go developer, but since I discovered Go, at the, I confess at the beginning is like you, you see the language, the syntax. You say, eh, I don't know, but then when I, I learned it, I just fell in love with Go. And now it's my, my favorite language, the language that I work the most with. And as I love Go, I love to share what I learned in Go. I'm working at Black Lane. We are uh, in the travel industry, and our mission is to make global top quality travel reliable and accessible by the touch of a button. So if this mission, this challenge sounds interesting, well, I think it's not for anyone, we are hiring, so you can check out our website or talk to me later on. Uh, yeah, and at Black Linear, I migrate ourselves to go, and I'm helping in this transition to migrate the company from Ruby to Go. So a bit of motivation from this talk. I think first things first is like to always keep learning new stuff and go and challenge myself. Um, and the GoFreeCon 2019, I was introduced to code generation Go. And also, with Go time about security, some nice ideas, put everything in a blender. We are here today. So, our agenda for today. So, we'll talk a bit about the definition of a code generation, quickly what they are useful. So, we're going to build our scenario. We can discuss a manual approach to solve that, how to generate code to solve it, and how to run it, like more integrate in our build pipeline. So, first, What's a code generator? I confess I was looking for like you know these really formal definitions like from the book. Code generator is that. I couldn't really find, so I got some stuff here. Code generator is a tool or resource that generates a particular sort of code or computer programming language. From Technopedia, Wikipedia says in computing, code generation is the process by which a compiler's code generator converts some intermediate representation of source code into a form that can be readily executed by a machine. Some more informal definitions, a program that writes a program, anything capable of writing code. Well, we are capable of writing code, right? We could kind of say that we are code generators, quite interesting ones. Uh, but for today, just focus that code generation is like a program that can write Go code, right? So some examples, if you don't know, Go test is a code generation tool. When you execute a Go test, it gets uh, your test and creates a whole binary, a whole Go program around it and executes it. Right? The formal definition would be that. Right? It scans the package to be tested, it writes out a Go program containing a test harness customized for the package, compiles it, and runs it. Yak is another code generation tool that reads a description of a grammar and it writes out the program to parse that grammar. If you're familiar with protocol buffers, protobuf, the proto C is a code generation tool. It reads the proto file and generates codes in the Desired the language based on the protofile. Why are they useful? Right. Basically, they automate stuff, right? Well, I think we can divide into main categories. One is just too repetitive to be doing all the time and to keep maintaining this code. And another one, like the stringer, that's one of the go tos. Uh, and another one, like the protocol buffers, is not just like a lot of code to be written, but also you need a lot of specific knowledge, right? So it's not easy for everyone to write it. So we have this tool to help us. So let's see how we're going to try to use a code generator. Code generator. So we all deal with some sort of sensitive data, right? So username, password, authentication credentials, secret keys, client keys, and also now with GDPR, a lot of information about people become sensitive information, right? So you have to be careful to do not leak it and store it properly. And when you're writing programs, more often than we want to admit, we face problems, right? Something doesn't work. We're integrating with some third parts API, or even better, like our own APIs, right? Within the company, the documentation is just old and outdated, 
or I was just doing like a few weeks ago, the documentation is for, was for Ruby and not Go. So we have some magic going around that documentation doesn't touch. And then you have to find out a way on that. And then, of course, problems appear, the bug time. We have several approaches for debug something. One of the most classical ones, the print debug approach. So we just start printing out stuff to the terminal. And sometimes we're going to print some sort of credential, something. My JWT token is in an invalid form. How can it be the invalid form? The code is right. I'm calling the right API. Why is happening? I have to see that, right? And you start to print stuff. That's fine. It's local environment, it's development. None of the keys there are really secret, right? They're just like more keys and so on. But you have to be really careful because sometimes this can almost make to production, right? I've seen things that got really close to production. So what if we could do something that could prevent these things to be leaked in production, right? So what's our solution? In Go, it's really easy to control how something gets printed. Right? You just have to implement the Stringer interface, and you have full control of everything that's printed from the given type. So you can use that. Right? If you implement the Stringer interface, you can just prevent the data itself to be printed, and you're going to print something else instead. So let's have our credentials here. We implement the Stringer interface with the string method, and we cross our fingers for the run to work. Come on, go present. Don't break me. <laughs> yes. Right. So we have the string interface implemented, and whoa. Some things happen, right? We have like our, our credentials leaked anyway. So if you check the string definition, the string is used to print values, pass it as operand to any format that accepts a string, or to unformatted printer such as print. Looks fine. But if you really pay attention of how I wrote it, I wrote with like percent hash v. And if you keep looking down the code, this is like comes from the Go source code definition. We find the Go stringer interface. And now we find the thing, right? The Go string method is used to print various paths passed as an operand to a hash percent hash v format. So if you really want to prevent things to be printed, we have to implement both the string, string interface and the Go stringer interface. And if you do it now, it works. And then now what do you do? You're just going to keep repeating it forever and ever. No, we can generate it. So let's see how we can make this thing automated. So yeah, generating the code. So obfuscate is going to be our code generation tool to obfuscate sensitive information when printing a goal type. Requirements, given a type, we implement the stringer and Go string interface to obfuscate the data when printing it. Our input is going to be the type name and a Go package. The output, a Go file with the generated code. So to generate this code, we have to do a few stuff. First, we have to load our Go package. Then we have to find our type inside the package. Then we're going to implement both interface, the stringer and the Go string interface. You're going to save it in a file. And finally, we're going to run Go import just to make sure that the code is well formatted and the imports are right. Loading the package. So there is a Go to package, the package packages that loads packages for inspection and analysis. That is like the first thing that becomes really nice. We now, once we load it, we have like Go source code as data struct, right? So instead of just this bunch of strings that we're used to write, we have something that we can use, a program can understand and infer meaning from. And you can start to take decisions upon that. So to be able to load a Go package, the first thing we're going to define what we want from this package. So we have this config. And then you say what we need. In our case, we need the types. Because you look for a type, you need some information about the type. We need the syntax, and we need the names. Um, yeah, so you pass this to mode. Like, if you go to the package config, you can see like the proper definition of everything that you can ask from the package. Right? So once we have chosen what we're going to load, we can just call packages load. And we're going to have like a list of Go packages. 
we can load more than one package at a time. For simplicity, we're only dealing with one. So then, we, of course, we handle the error, and then you check if you have more than one package. We should not have, but just in case we have, we throw an error. Right, we have our package at hand, and now we can inspect the package and find our type inside the package. To do that, it's really easy. Once we have the package, we can just access the types, and then the scope. Within the scope, you're going to have the, de the declared names, variables, constants, and functions. And then you can say, please, find something with the name that I defined at the beginning, our target name. If you get something, it was found. If we get new, it was not found, so you handle the error. And now that we have our type in our write package, we can implement the stringer and the go stringer stringer interfaces. So basically, what we're going to do is something like that, right? We're going to just print out an obfuscated code, the classical thing, just a bunch of stars. And how to really do that? Well, to help us, we can use the text template package and write a piece of Go code and fill in with the data regarding our type, right? So then here we have the, the template. And this line is really common to have in generated code to help humans and machines to know that this code is generated. It should not be changed only by the tool which generated the code. And also, this is like a regular expression. So to make it easier for machines to know that this file should not be changed, right? So, but we have our type at hand, right? We can infer a lot more information rather than knowing that we have the type with the right name. So let's play a bit more. Let's divide our type in two types of types, two kinds of types. One type is everything that's underlying types is string, so something like type password string. And the other kind is everything else. So if the type that we're trying to obfuscate is its underlying types of string, we're going to print the number of stars that has the same thing as the length of the string. If not, you're just going to print 10 stars. So how can you discover that, inspect our type? So the object that we loaded from the lookup function, we can ask the type of it. And once we have the type, you can ask the underlying type, get a single representation of its underlying type, and compare. Deadly simple. And then we're going to choose between one of these two templates to fill in our Go stringer and the stringer implementations. We have a small function that chooses from one of the two, and depending on that, it merges these two pieces of code with our template. Right, so generating the code. Now, first thing, we're going to check if the underlying type is a string, as I showed before. And then if you all, all the information that we need, the package name comes from the package that we loaded, so we don't really have to know beforehand, because we are loading the current package in the current directory, our type name, our receiver, and just getting the first character of the type name, lowercase int, just to keep with the convention. Once we have all the data, we can create our template. And then finally, we execute the template and print it to uh, IO writer, right? So we have our template, and then now we have to save them. Well. First things first, but not necessarily in this order, right? So this, this IO writer is actually the file already. So to save to a file, pretty simple Go code, you just open the file. We have a, I have a small function for that, returns a file. That's a writer that goes to the function that writes the template. And then later on, we close the file. Um, now to run Go imports, again, there is no much magic. Let's go. It's really simple. We are just calling the, the CLI application go import on our file and getting it to run to make sure that the, our code is beautiful. So let's see. I got everything together. I've just showed you guys a bunch of pieces of code. So this is pretty much our, um, the main function of our small code generation. Generator. So the first thing that we do is get the target name, the target type name, that's the parameter, 
and then you load the package. I've shown before, I have a debug line just to help us to see what's happening. We look up for a type to make sure that you are trying to use the right type in the right package, but also because later on we're going to see it's on the line type. We create the file, and then we generate the code executing that template to the file, we close it, and finally, we run go imports on the file. And now, how do we run it, right? Because we have a tool, but how can we make it part from our build process? Well, simple way of doing that, the usage of a tool is just called obfuscate type name, and generate it, it generates the code. However, since Go 1.4, that's like even before I have started with Go, Go added the tool called Generate. Generate is one Go tool to help to add code generation tools to the build process of Go programs, right? So what Generate does, it inspects Go source code for a special kind of comment. That's this one. So it's comment go colon generate. And then after that, you can just pass whatever you want to call your code generation tool. That will be basically the name of the tool into whatever argument it takes. Right? And then later on, how would you use that? You would call generate before go build. So this is quite important. Go generate is not part of the go building process. So if you could just call go build or go test or go run, it's not going to run the go generate instructions that you find in the code. You have to explicitly call go generate first, right? Otherwise, you're not going to have the code generated. Um, yeah. So in our example, how will you do that? So you just call obfuscate credentials if your credential stops. And of course, this comment that invokes a code generation tool can be anywhere in your source code. And usually, you try to keep it together with whatever it is inspecting, right? In our cases, fits quite well just be above our types. And now, demo type. Let's cross our fingers. Let's show everything together. So this is my main function to my obfuscate tool. As I showed to you, this is like exactly the source code that you can see on these slides. Oh, yeah, by the way, I was, you saw at the beginning, it's going to be at the end. All these slides and the source code that are available on my GitHub. So yeah, so we pass the arguments again, load the package, make the lookup, create the file, generate the code, uh, close the file and save it, and then all the helper functions that I showed to you guys. And these comments that you see, that's a bit odd. These are the things that I use to refer to the present tool, so it knows which piece of code to show there, right? Uh, so I have a small example. Uh, actually, no? OK. So I created here two small types. One that's just an underlying string, and another one that's a struct. And based on that, I have a small demo program that what it does is just to print out stuff. Right? So I will instantiate it. I add some data, and I print it. So, oh, yeah, you can't really see, right? You can't see, can you? Does anyone remember how to increase the font here? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, so if I just run it before generating it, nothing happens. But if I go, I go generate, generate, um, yeah, make build. So here we see that our tool was invoked twice, right? And in the package model, it was looking for the type secret. And then again, in the same package model, it was looking for the type another secret. And then now we have our binary. Oops. 
and then we have it. Everything is obfuscated, and this one is like our type that we saw before. That's just a string. And then the number of stars match the length of the string itself. In the other one that was a, a struct, it, we have only 10, um, 10 stars obfuscating it. Right? Uh, and then, uh, as I showed before, this tool is like a, a CLI tool. And I can just run go go install in my on this tool that's you want to make like the binary available to the go on the go bin folder so our go generate can just find it so yep that's what we have for you guys today so do you guys have any questions Yeah, so there is my contact, the link for the, the slides of the talks. And oh, I have some nice, oh, go for stickers. So if you guys want some nice sticker later on, just ask me. If you have no further questions, thank you very much. <laughs>